The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we are coming to you live from our studios in Woodland Hills. Today is, I, I know I've got it here somewhere, it's June 26th. I can never remember what the date is so I have to look at my uh, thing to see it. It's June 26th so it's Monday and it is a week and a day before the 4th of July. So we felt, in fact, Traven was the one who suggested that we talk about avoiding sensory meltdowns because we have a lot of stuff coming up. I don't know if it's like this in your neighborhood, but the fireworks have already started in our neighborhood and my dogs are, are like, you know, on the ceiling with their talons out uh, every time one of them goes off in the neighborhood. So that's my dogs. Think about for our kiddos that are on the spectrum, think about our veterans that have been through battle and, you know, and how about just those of us who react to a loud noise, right? So it can be very trying. And it's, you know, 4th of July is not the only time that it can be trying, but we're going to talk about some things that you can do to help yourself or help the person that you love to avoid a sensory meltdown right from the jump, right? Um, and, and it's not just, uh, let me uh, say this, it's, good morning, Zah. It's not just saying, oh, keep them home in a padded room, because that, that's not the ticket, right? We want to be able to enjoy our lives, but not be at the mercy of our parasympathetic nervous system when there's a noise or if there's a flashing light or whatever it is. So we'll talk about what we can potentially do to help with that. Uh, and it's not an exhaustive list, it's just 10 tips. So from me, a parent. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Shannon. I'm a proud pony. A pony is a parent of a neurodiverse individual. I am very much that and thrilled to be here. So uh, I do always like to give the disclaimer that we have lots of experts on the show. I'm not one of them. I don't have expertise in anything other than, I, no, I was going to say my life, but I don't have any expertise in my own life, so why would I kid about that? Uh, I'm just somebody who has been on this path for a while and cares very deeply about you and the people that you love on the spectrum. This show is a parent-to-parent -parent talk, and I want to be clear that we do many different things on Autism Live, but this is called a parent-to-parent -parent talk. It really is meant to be a conversation among parents, but we welcome, if you are a person on the spectrum, Spectrum, we always welcome your input, yeah? And you might be a person on the spectrum who is also a parent, right? Uh, so, but our whole show, when we do things here at the Autism Network, our, our whole mission is to provide information and inspiration to that larger autism community, which starts with individuals who are themselves on the spectrum. We love to have you guys take the mic here in many different ways, including our show, Stories from the Spectrum, but as guests and sometimes guest hosts here on Autism Live, um, we, I want you to know that we understand you're the beating heart of our community and we, all we want is to be good allies, right? And to give you the microphone is a way to be an ally. But we also include in our mission everybody who loves individuals around the autism spectrum, that we want to give them information and inspiration as well. Because we feel that if we all band together, uh, we are a voting block, <laughs> we are, we are uh, a culture that is, we know, much more than 2% of the population of the world now, and that we can help each other and perhaps take our voice and like Horton Hears Who, uh, put them all together so that the world can hear us and we can get to better progress, better respect, jobs, living situations, all of that for individuals who are on the autism spectrum. That's why we're here. So. I uh, just wanted to clue you into that. But again, I'm not an expert. Uh, we do encourage you to watch. We have a library of videos. This is our 13th year of doing this show. So we have, oh, we've, we've talked about, <laughs> thank you, Trayvon. We've talked about so many things. We encourage you to check out all the different ways Trayvon was showing you that you can watch, that you can download the podcast. 
You can go on our YouTube channel and search topics. You can do all kinds of things. But if you're not seeing easily the topic that you want to have talked about, please, by all means, interact with us. We're live right now on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and a dozen other sites that Traven just showed you. Zaz writing in right now on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, Twitter, or uh, YouTube, you can just write in on that platform and it shows up here on my screen and we can have a conversation in real time. So let me tell you a little bit. Uh, first of all, before I go into all of this, I do want to remind you that tomorrow's show, Ask Dr. Doreen, Dr. Doreen Grampiche will be live in the studio with me. We've been making some changes for Ask Dr. Doreen because it is its own podcast now. It has its own feed. Like you can subscribe and just get Ask Dr. Doreen now if you want to. Uh, we want you to be, you can start looking for it on um, the different uh, podcast platforms. It's about to have its own app. That is not yet, so I don't want to tease too much, but it's coming. Uh, I also want you to know that you can go to her new, newly refurbished website, which is askdrdoreen.com. You can also get there by going to doreengrampiche.com, and you'll find you know, video snippets, you'll find audio snippets, you'll find all these wonderful things uh, going on there. You can see some of the, she's been doing a lot of press about the prevalence and about toxicity in our environment and what that has to do with prevalence. You can watch all of those and be updated on everything to do with Ask Dr. Doreen and Dr. Grambichet by going to askdrdoreen.com. Now, for the moment, we're going to continue. We stopped, and then we were like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do that yet. Uh, for the moment, we're going to continue to put her podcast out on the Autism Live um, platform as well, so it'll appear in both places. But we won't be doing that much longer. So you'll want to make sure that you subscribe to the Ask Dr. Doreen podcast. So go into whatever the platform that you watch your or listen to your podcast in and, and subscribe right now. And there will probably be, you know, information that you will get as a subscriber that you may not otherwise. So uh, I don't know. I think it's a good thing to do. I also want to encourage you to review the Ask Dr. Doreen podcast because that's the way that people get to know it. So if you go on Apple Podcasts or any platform and give it a good review, then other people on that platform will find it. And if you love Ask Dr. Doreen like we do, then you'll want to make sure that other people find it as well. So uh, I do want to say that for tomorrow's topic for Ask Dr. Doreen, we're going to take on the controversy surrounding ABA. So that will be tomorrow's topic. I know you'll all want to tune in for that. <laughs> so, but today here, this parent to parent talk, we're talking about the top 10 tips for avoiding sensory meltdowns uh, because we feel like it's timely. Now, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through the top 10 things and I'm, I'm not, as much as I want to, I'm not going to talk too much about them. I'm just going to say what they are. And then I will go back and talk about them at length. But for those of you who are in a hurry, we want to make sure that you get to hear what they are. But believe me, it's much better if you watch the whole thing. So here it is. Top 10 tips for avoiding sensory meltdowns. You know, I always like to give some sort of a disclaimer at the beginning. And for this one, it's really about setting everyone up for success thinking about what's on board, right? This isn't even one of the tips. This is just overreaching all of the tips. So, you know, are you overtired? Are you, you know, stay hydrated, stay rested. You're going to do better with sensory things if you make sure that you're in a good place. And if somebody isn't, then you're going to minimize what the sensory things are that could overlie. Look, that goes throughout this entire thing. We'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, so our number one tip, uh, know as much as you can about the location of the, and the event. Great tip. Number two, pack a distractor bag. If you don't know what that is, stay tuned. We'll talk about it. Number three, you want to mitigate sound issues so that you have the ability to deaden some of the sound issues if you need to. Number four, you're going to mitigate visual stimuli because uh, that's a good thing to do. No, did I not put a number? Oh, I'm covering it. Number five, use empowering language when talking about feelings and sensory and meltdowns. We'll, we'll give you examples in a second. Number six, I'm, it jumped to seven. Number six, practice breathing techniques outside of sensory issues, yeah? Uh, number seven, use your senses to watch for the signs that you or someone else is nearing a sensory meltdown because it's better to stop it before it gets all the way to meltdown, yeah? Number eight, be willing to change your tactics. If you're trying one thing, you're like, okay, I'm going to try this thing, but if it's not working, let's try something else, right? Be willing. Number nine, balance inclusion with minimizing 
minimizing stimuli. It's, this is this thing about we're not just going to stay home. That's not the ticket, but we do have to balance. You know, I think sometimes we go and I say I promised I wasn't going to talk about it. number ten. Uh, model having boundaries. If you're trying to help a loved one to get through sensory meltdowns, you yourself need to model having a boundary of knowing when is it time to stop and do all of those things. Okay, there are 10 tips. Now let's go back and talk about all of them, especially that first one, because I think that this is the, the 10 things work better if you take this, this first overreaching tip into consideration. That if you just stop and think about, and I'm going to put this because we're coming up on 4th of July uh, I, and it's there and it's available. I'm going to put it in that context, but we can talk about all different kinds of sensory uh, overload. But holidays in particular are ripe. doesn't matter whether it's one where we're exploding things that have loud boom noises, right? Thanksgiving can be overwhelming sensory. Christmas can be overwhelming. Valentine's Day can be overwhelming. Tuesday can be overwhelming overwhelming sensory wise, right? Anything has the potential to be. But have you noticed, like, let's just think about for yourself right now, even if you're not the person who's on the spectrum, we all have the ability to have sensory overload. And, and we should remove the stigma that it isn't just when we don't like something. Sometimes it's when we like something. My mother um, loved to quilt. Love, love, love to quilt, thought it was the most wonderful thing. And then uh, she went on a vacation and they went to, what's the place in Missouri where they, it's sort of like a mini Las Vegas and they have all of these um, old opera houses and uh, they have people that perform there. And this was many, many years ago. And my mother was going to go see Andy Williams perform at one of these things. And somebody said to her, oh, you love to quilt? You have to go to this quilt store that is on this strip. Branson, that's the name of it, Branson, Missouri. So uh, she was so excited. They said, this is like the most amazing quilt store. It's heaven for you, Patty. And my mother walked in, opened the door, and there was so much quilting stuff that truly she loved more than anything else that she turned around and walked right back out and said, I can't, I can't go in there. It's too much. I'm overwhelmed. She was having trouble breathing, right? So I, I give that as an example that even if it's something you love, it can be overwhelming. So we want to start with this, setting everybody up with, um, for success by not putting things into boxes and labeling them good or bad. Let's just say it is. And it is on, a, on one day more than another, right? It's not like you can go, well, we've done the measurements on it, and this is exactly how much sound I can take or exactly how much sound my child can take, right? Because what else is on board? Are they, think about yourself, and if you're exhausted and tired, where is your level of coping with things that are challenging? It might be hampered. You might be somebody who like, oh, no, I can, I can take that to a certain degree. But I was just with friends and somebody was talking about how, well, I'm allergic to things, but it seems like I'm more allergic to things during certain times of the year. And I said, well, that makes total sense, right? And they said, why? I've never understood this. Why do I, if I eat something that I'm allergic to, I, I have more trouble with it in the month of April than I do any other month. That doesn't make any sense. And I said, but it totally does because you're looking at the total load. And so if you're allergic to flowers and the flowers have bloomed, bloomed in April, then your body is less likely to be able to handle your milk allergy and you will have more hives as a and they went oh but all of life is that way isn't it for all of us and of course it's it's on a sliding scale different for each one of us but what's on board plays a role in our ability to cope and if what we really want to be able to do is cope because we want to be included and we want to mitigate sensory things so that we can experience them without being overwhelmed, then we want to set ourselves and everybody else up for success. So this goes across the board. So if I'm a mom and I'm taking my child to a fireworks display, I need to be well rested. I need to be well hydrated. I need to not be, you know, running around with my blood sugar going up and down and whatever because I haven't eaten because my ability to help him cope and to come up with strategies is going to be hampered if I haven't taken care of myself. But then what about my child? If my child is underslept 
and has not eaten and is, you know, dehydrated, his ability to cope is going to be hampered. So if we're setting everybody else, uh, everybody up for success, we want to think about what's on board. Um, good morning, Anna. So happy that you're here with us. So everything that I'm going to say is a strategy that will work better if you take this into consideration. And they're not one size fits all. And you might go, oh, well, number seven makes great sense to me, but I don't like number four. That's okay. We're, we're just trying to put tools into a toolbox for you of ways that, and, and we always talk about this, that we try to get some things beforehand and some things as things are happening and some things after. So um, we've got a nice little mix here. So let's take a look. So number one here, we want to know as much as we can about the location or the event. Think about this. So if I'm going to a friend's house for a 4th of July barbecue, I can have a conversation with a friend and say, hey, tell me a little bit about what's the plan for the day. Uh, and I do this. And people probably think I'm weird. You know what? I don't care. Uh, and I encourage you not to care either. <laughs> because uh, you get in the habit of this and you find that life goes better. So if I'm going to the friends, I say, hey, what, you know, what can I bring, right? You always start in, in the place of, we're really excited to come, what can I bring, right? And then sometimes they'll tell you, oh, well, you know, we're gonna have hot dogs and pizza and whatever, so you get a little feel for that about what's gonna be happening. And then you can say, um, are, you know, are, is, is everybody gonna be swimming? Should we bring our swimsuits? These are rational questions, but what, what's happening is, you're extrapolating more from it. If you know that your kid gets very overwhelmed when people are splashing, then you know, you're know you gonna think to yourself, okay, we're gonna pack the swimsuit, but we're gonna bring some things that are outside the pool activities. If my friend says, oh yeah, we're gonna be in the pool all day long, and I know that my kiddo can't handle that, then I know I'm gonna pack something for him to do, which might be his iPad, it might be you know whatever. I'm also, if my kid is very sensory, um, like noises and crowds really get to him, I might say to my friend, hey, we're coming and we're planning on spending the day, but you know, sometimes Billy gets overwhelmed. Is there a place in the house that I can, if he starts to get a little before it gets too much, is there a quiet place in the house that I might be able to take him and hang out for a little while? Let me just tell you something. The friend that goes, what? Why, why would you want to do that? Oh, I don't have a place for that. You really want to think about if that's the house that you want to go to. Because think about how you would react if somebody said something. You would go, oh my gosh, you know, uh, like we, we, you know, they can go into Susie's bedroom. Nobody's going to be in there. And that can be a place that, you know, that he can... Like, that's the kind of person I know you all to be, and those are the kinds of people you want to hang around with. And if they're going to act like that's an outrageous, weird thing, you probably aren't going to spend that much time with them, you know? Or you might have to leave in the middle of the party if there's no place for them to go where it's quiet. Maybe you only stay for two hours, and then you then you leave, right? And if they get fatutsed about that, again, not your friend. Uh, not not your people. Not people you, because you know, who, who, I don't know. Why are people like that? I don't, want, I don't have time for people like that. They're living their own life. Let's think of them with love, but you're on an avenue where you need some help and support. That's not helpful and support. But I was, uh, this, getting back to what the tip is, know as much as you can about the location and the event. You know, I, I do this if we're going to a restaurant. I Google the restaurant and look at the menu before I go, right? Uh, if we're gonna go to a museum, they have floor plans. This is why I put a floor plan, a blueprint on here. They have floor plans where you can look and see all the different things in the museum and you can find, oh, that's where they have the food court. This is where they have the quiet zone. This is where the bathrooms are. Uh, you don't have to be compulsive about it, but having a feel for the lay of the land is so helpful. It will reduce your stress and give you strategies so that you'll know all right, if we need to take a break, then this is what we will do. I've done this even where I, if I know that I'm going to somebody's house who is that person, well, I know I have to have a place for you to be quiet, right? Then I look around and, and see what is, a, what is around. Like, is there a shopping mall that's around? Because I know you think, oh, shopping malls are so loud. The truth is, is that you can go into the back of a Macy's and it's the most quiet place in the world. 
right? And if you need to get your kid out for a little while, you say, oh, you know, I got to run to the drugstore, and you go and you have a quiet time, or just drive around in your car. Okay, but five minutes of research. I'm not asking you to write a dissertation <laughs> on what the event is, but five minutes of research to find out, hey, what's happening? And then you don't hold it too precious and too tight because sometimes you get there and the place is under construction or your friend forgot and that, you know, she was watching somebody's dog and the room is taken, right? But if you have a beginning plan, it will help you to be able to strategize in the moment. Uh, okay. Number two, pack a distractor bag. I love this, and I talk about it on the show all the time, that uh, we had a bag of toys, that little, little bag. I mean, you know, it was, it, it was like this long, and, and it was this wide, and it, my mother made it eventually, and it had zippers all over it, so he could just play with the zippers. But in each little pocket, there were different wind-up toys, and there was Silly Putty, and there were Lego minifigures eventually. Eventually, there was a deck of cards. Uh, it's it's something to keep them occupied. Now, I will tell you that later on, as kids get older and they have like um, their their Nintendo Switch or you know the back in the day he had the little handheld Nintendo thing, or they have their phones, right? But and that becomes the distractor bag. But if if you don't want your child, some of you are like, I don't want them on screens all that much. It's fine. Or if they're too little to be on screens, pack the distractor bag. But when one of the things we all do, we do this for ourselves. If you, I, I I was in line at Costco the other day and it was a madhouse, like crazy amounts of people in Costco. And once you got into a line, I saw everybody was on their phone. Everybody was on their phone, and, and that was the way that they were helping themselves with the sensory overwhelm of I'm having to stand here and not do anything else until I go through. I would venture that if everybody didn't have their phones, people would have been more agitated, right? So you need something to help them to be able to be distracted from those uncomfortable feelings of I don't know what's happening, I'm having to wait, I'm excited about the thing that's, or I'm anxious about the thing that's happening. You want little things that don't, you don't want to pack a uh, a 500 piece puzzle, right? That would take too much time to do. So we want little things that have a big reward. I've said before that we had these little wind up toys that, cause you know, first of all, you had to wind it up, right? And then you would, and it was like, one of them was a monkey that would do a backflip, right? And after the monkey would do like three or four backflips, okay, well, we've played with that now. Now that goes back into the zipper bag and then the next one comes out, right? Uh, and it's another toy that ha does another thing. So. I, I, I love things that don't take too long, but the older the child and the more their ability to attend, you can get to things like the deck of cards, that we would play card games in restaurants while we were waiting, or in the doctor's office while we were waiting. Again, you can do this on your phone uh, when kids are older, but I still think the distractor bag is pretty good. Again, I think about my mom. My mom never went anywhere that she didn't have some form of knitting or crochet in her bag and a book and a bottle of water. Never went anywhere without those things. And if she got caught someplace without them, anxiety, right? And she would start to notice the sensory things going on. Uh, okay, Sky4 has written in and said, please tell nonverbal autistic child syllabus. So um, anything that we're teaching Sky, um, we can teach to an individual who's nonverbal. We just make accommodations for it, right? Um, and so if you tell me like specifically what you're trying to teach, then we can talk specifically about what accommodations we would make. But all the things that we're talking about here work verbal, nonverbal. The distractor bag, same thing. Verbal, nonverbal would be the, the same thing. Okay, so have the distractor bag. We just had it. We had one in my car and one in my husband's car. And so wherever we were, we had it, right? Um, okay, number three, mitigating sound. This is really important because sound is such a big thing. And uh, we've been going back to movie theaters to see movies. And, you know, they have that Nicole Kidman thing in the AMC movie theaters where she talks about how it's just this visceral experience being in a movie theater, but she, at one point she says, sound I can feel. <laughs> I wanted to go, yes, that's what I don't like about being in a movie theater, that they play the sound so loud that it vibrates in your bones. 
I don't care for that. That's not a good sensory experience for me. And I know a lot of people, it's not a good sensory experience. I remember when my son was little and it was before we really knew about the noise canceling headphones that we had a little hat for him that had, you know, the flaps that turn up. I don't know what those are called, those kinds of hat, but he, we would pull the flaps down and he would watch the movie with the hat with the flaps down because it just muffled the sound. It didn't make it so that he couldn't hear at all, but it muffled the sound enough so that he wasn't having ear damage, you know, because it gets, so, especially in the previews, we don't need to be assaulted. So there are all kinds of different headphones that they have now. Um, you know, you can get noise canceling headphones, but then they really can't hear what's happening. Um, and for some kiddos, that's going to be the ticket. Although I encourage you, if that's not the thing that your kiddo has to have, um, then don't give them completely noise, noise canceling. I love, uh, they have leap max headphones that I love that you can play meditation music or they can listen to music um, from a Bluetooth um, or they can just mitigate sound, right? But now they've got a whole line of earplugs that are spe specifically designed to allow you to hear, like they have earplugs that you can tune sound out, but these are earplugs that are allowed, that are specifically designed to mitigate the sound and nobody can see them. Um, and, and it helps you to be able to hear, but not have it be overwhelming. It's just that turning the dial down. Uh, now it could be that it's the opposite too, that, that your child has a hearing issue and that they're having trouble hearing. I have many people in my life now, and I think I'm about to qualify for needing hearing aids. Uh, and, but anybody who wears hearing aids will tell you that there are certain sounds that they have it dialed up for. And even though they have settings now, then occasionally there'll be a certain type of noise that is wah loud in their hearing aids. So we want to mitigate all of that, but it, it really is a dance where you got to figure out, okay, what do I need? What strategy do I need so that I can make it through whatever the sensory issue is? That really means knowing what you or your child need and being willing to try different things. If at first the headphones don't work, it might be that the setting on the headphones is not quite right, right? And you have to be willing to trial and error it. Okay, uh, mitigating the visual stimuli because sometimes, uh, you know, the truth is, is when my mother walked into that quilting store, it was visually overwhelming, just visually overwhelming. We've seen that putting sunglasses on, on people sometimes can help because it just brings everything down a little bit. Um, putting different colored lenses on people can absolutely, we've been looking at the research uh, for it, can absolutely help people to deal with sensory and focus. I know some people ha like to wear those steampunk glasses that have the sides sort of blacked out so that they can focus on what's ahead, whereas other people need big glasses so that they can see things in the periphery. We've seen that um, prism glasses for some people are help them to deal with sensory issues, that they report that they can hear better that they can focus better on sound with prism lenses. I can't explain that to you. I don't understand it. I'm just telling you what people have reported. But if you've, it makes sense to a certain degree, right? Because we go back to that, you know, what's on board. That if I am, if I've been inside where it's dark all day and I walk outside and I'm in the blaring sun and I'm like this, right? I'm not able to take in other information right then because my eyes are hurting and I'm like, where are my sunglasses, right? And I'm not able to hear the conversation that you're telling me. So a certain amount of that makes sense to me. Uh, but the ins and outs of it, I don't entirely get. But some people have said that putting fun colored um, sunglasses on their child during fireworks helps them so that they're not overwhelmed. Um, you know, maybe having headphones with music playing and sunglasses is what your child needs to be able to sit and enjoy the fireworks with you. And if that were the case, wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't it be great to have them there and have them enjoy it with you instead of them feeling scared and feeling like, I don't know what's happening and getting to that overwhelmed spot. Okay, using empowering language. I think that this is really important because as somebody who has experienced 
panic disorder and, and sometimes has sensory overload, I think it's really important that we make a safe space for the people that we love in our lives to accept them for who they are and how they are. I mean, all of us have the potential to be overwhelmed at some point. And if you think about when you are overwhelmed, is someone treating you with dignity and kindness and accepting that this is what is overwhelming for you? Or do you want somebody there who's like, get over it? Because that helped who, when, never, anybody, right? So I'm really a fan of using empowering language and languaging it for the people that we love and saying to them things like, you're doing a good job, this is a lot, um, and you're having a lot of feelings about it, and you know, saying to them that it is okay that you're having feelings about this, and saying, are you experiencing that this is very loud for you? Would you like it to be less loud? Um, asking those questions, but am, using language that lets them know that the, it's a human experience that we are all overwhelmed sometimes, that it is not something that is wrong with them or something that they have to change how they feel. If we've already gotten to the point where they are at sensory overload, please let's not say to them, you need to get over it, you need to get better at this, why can't you do this, why are you wrecking it for everyone else? None of that is helpful or useful. Um, but, but saying, I'm here with you, you're okay, I'm right here with you, you're okay, it's loud. Shall we get to the place where it's a little less loud? Um, do you wanna put on my hoodie and put it over so that it's less loud and I will sit here with you? How about if we get out the bag of toys? And how about if we do something because yes, it feels loud for you. I, I hear that, that you're, it's loud. I'm here with you, right? Those are the kinds of things that we wanna to say to use empowering language and not diminish them for how they feel. Uh, I can't say enough how important that is. Okay, but we do wanna put some things in place that will help us, things, strategies that we can do so that if we're in that moment, that we can talk about things and say, would you like to do these things that we've already done before in practice that would be empowering? So I love breathing techniques. If you're listening, we've got a picture of a teddy bear on the screen because this, you know, we used to talk about breathing techniques and people would write in and say, I have a two-year-old. How do you teach a two-year-old to do breathing techniques with a teddy bear or a stuffed animal? Beanie babies are fine, right? They, they call it breathing buddies. And what you do is you lay down on the floor with your toddler or your five-year-old or your 15-year-old, right? Anybody can do this. And none of us is too old to put a stuffed animal on our bellies, right? Um, so this could work with anybody. Obviously, if our kids are older and they have a little bit more receptive uh, ability, then we can work on this in different ways, but this is easy. You take the, you, and you have, you have to have two stuffed animals. You put one on your belly, you put one on the other person that you're teaching how to do this, and you say, okay, we're gonna, let's practice. We're gonna make the beanie baby or the teddy bear, we're gonna make them go up, right? Now, in the beginning, they're just gonna push their stomachs up. That's okay. It's totally okay, don't worry about that. Because then we're gonna say, okay, now we're gonna make them come down, but we're gonna do it slowly. And so you do the exhale to make it come down and you're modeling the behavior. And then you go, okay, now we're gonna breathe in really slowly and we're gonna make the, the bear go up again. And eventually, even toddlers, even if their receptive language is not great, even if they're nonverbal, they will, if you hang with them long enough, they get the gist of it and it starts to feel good for them, and then they wanna do it. So you do this again and again and again with the breathing buddies until they really have it. Then you start practicing it without the breathing buddies, and you say, okay, so right, we're gonna hold hands right now, and we're gonna pretend that we're laying on our floor, and then we're gonna do the breathing buddies. So we're gonna breathe in slow and make the buddy go up, and we're gonna breathe out slow and make the buddy go down. You wanna practice this a lot with your kiddos and then you wanna model this a lot with your kiddos. That if you are getting in the car, uh, this was somebody taught me this, that you know I would get, it was a lot getting my son into the car and getting him into his five point harness and ooh, it was a lot for me. He was a big kid, took a lot of muscles that I don't have. It was a lot and sometimes there was a struggle. 
you know, um, it was a lot. But then I would get him into the harness and then I would get into the car to drive and somebody taught me before you drive away, you should take three deep breaths. You will be a better driver if you take three deep breaths. I didn't realize that it also was something that I modeled for my son who was in the back seat. That people, imitation is a thing that not everybody, but a lot of people tend to do. And if you do it over and over and over again. So I would count and I would do three breaths. And he got to the point where he was doing that as well. This is good, good practice for all of us to practice breathing techniques, to model them, to do them so that if we see that things are escalating towards um, uh, a meltdown, that we're having sensory issues, that it's one of the things that we have in our back pocket. That if the meltdown is starting, we could use any of the things that we talked about. We could say, oh, you know, hey, how about this? Would you like to play with your wind-up toys, right, as maybe distract? And if that's not working, we go, I know, let's, let's do a breathing game for a second and let's see, you know, how many um, seconds we can push the air out, right? Um, Try that, right? Okay, number seven, we want to use all of our senses to watch for the signs. I'm not good at this. Can I be honest at this? I'm not good at recognizing it in myself, and I'm not good at recognizing it in other people. But I've worked on that over the years, and I'm a little bit better than I used to be. You know who's good at this? My son. I don't know why. It could be the good ABA that he had. But he will say to me, he will say, Mom, you're getting upset. Maybe you should take a breath. <laughs> he says that to me all the time. Uh, I say that to him much less than he says that to me. So we're watching for what the signs are in ourselves and in other people. And maybe you'll be better at this than I am because if you, if you can get good about this, you can head off all of the meltdowns, really, because as you see it start to ramp, then you do something to mitigate it and it goes better. Um, but try to watch this in yourself and try to watch this in other people. Or have my son around, he'll tell you. Uh, number eight, obviously, being willing to change tactics. So if I am uh, with someone and we're at uh, fireworks and, we, and I see that it starts, that it's, it's building, and I see signs of it because the child is getting anxious and they're making noises and they're stimming and, uh, you know, all kinds of things that I go, okay, I see that they're trying to cope. First of all, recognize that is what it is, that they're trying, to, they're trying to regulate themselves. Don't language that wrong, but try to help them. Uh, you can say, let's get out the distractor bag. Let's play with the, would you like your headphones? Let's put some music on, right? But you might find that depending on where they are in their escalation scale, that they'll, they'll be refusal. Um, be willing to let that go and try something else. Be willing to put the sunglasses on. You might be thinking to yourself, the sunglass thing is not going to work. It's a sound thing. Um, but be willing to change tactics and try something else, including being willing to leave before it gets too bad. That's the last ditch effort because we really want them to be included. But if you have to, you leave, right? That's just a no brainer. Um, and that's part of what number nine is. Let's balance inclusion with minimizing stimuli. So here are the mistakes that you can make. And they're common, and you have to forgive yourself if you make the mistake. I certainly have made both of these mistakes. One is that you just decide to stay home and go, well, we can't be a part of those things. We can't go to Disneyland. We can't go to fireworks. We can't go to a holiday party. We can't go to a place where everybody's splashing in a pool and you language it that way for yourself. This is a mistake. Don't beat yourself up if you have made this mistake in the past or if you make it in the future. Just notice it and be willing to change your tactic, right? But here is, uh, so we, because we need to be included. We need to be included and our kids need to be included. And some of it is we have to figure out how we do that. And some of it is the world has to figure out how do they accept our kids. It's not perfect. I'm not tell you, telling you that there's going to be no heartache, but you have to keep trying. And sometimes the world is going to reject you and your kid. It's true. I wish it wasn't true, but we can't just go home. We've been there and done that. Generations before us, people, and they're still doing it in places like Uganda and Romania where the kids are in their houses with the blinds drawn. This is not the ticket. Sometimes you're going to be uncomfortable. 
Sometimes the people are going to be uncomfortable because your child is making noises. We all need to grab a big whoopee and still do it anyway. Um, on the flip side, there are people who are like, nope, my kid is going to everything and they're just going to experience it. And the kid is struggling because it's too much. So we got to find that balance. Like how do we get them in the circumstance, but how do we mitigate, mitigate and minimize stimuli to, stimuli to the point that they're still experiencing it, but not getting to the point of overwhelmed? You know, if I had been with my mom at the quilting store, I would have gone outside with her and I would have done some breathing exercises with her. And, I, and then I would have said, hey, how about this? How about if we just go in and look at the calico fabric and we don't look at anything else? In fact, you can put on your sunglasses. I'm going to lead you over to the calico fabric and we're just going to look at calico and we're going to look at it for like four minutes and then we're going to come outside and take a break again. That's probably what I would have done. And maybe she would have found that she was okay after the calico fabric and that she got distracted by looking at something else and maybe she would have been able to look around the store or maybe not, right? Um, but I feel sad that she didn't get to experience this thing that was going to be really fun with her because it was too much. I don't want that for our kids. I don't want that for any of us, right? So it's a balancing act and some days you're going to hit it right and some days you're not. Forgive yourself and come back and keep willing to try it again. And then number 10, we need to model having boundaries. If there is one thing that the pandemic taught me, it is that boundaries are important and that we have to model for our kids what it is like to have boundaries. And let me just tell you, not everybody is okay when you have boundaries. I saw the greatest thing this weekend that somebody said, you know, you really don't know a person until you have been around them when they don't get their way. And that is when you meet the person in earnest. I want to say to all of you, and I'm putting my loving arms around all of you as parents of individuals who are on the autism spectrum, that you are going to meet in your life people who want to have it their way. And your child having a diagnosis of autism and having different needs is not going to be allowing this person to have it their way. It might be Aunt Betty who's like, I want to have Thanksgiving dinner and think that means having Thanksgiving dinner at 3.30 and we all sit down and we all eat turkey together and that is the way we do Thanksgiving. And Aunt Betty wants that and it's the thing that she wants no matter what and she's got a table and she wants 18 people to sit at it. Well, that's great, except that your four-year-old who is on the spectrum is not going to be able to wait till 3.30 to have dinner. Which means, and if Aunt Betty is like, I want you here at 12 because we're going to watch football and we're going to prepare food, but then we're going to eat at 3.30, and you show up with a baggie of food and you sit down and you feed your four-year-old at her table at noon, and Aunt Betty's head is going to come off and spin around the room. And she's not going to be happy about it. And you know what? Oh, well. <laughs> like, it is so important that you model having that boundary for your kid in front of your kid to Aunt Betty and say, Aunt Betty, I'm sorry, this is the way it needs to be, right? That it's a boundary and that you don't sacrifice what your child needs because Aunt Betty wants it her way, right? We all need to get comfortable with this idea that we don't control other people. You don't control Aunt Betty. You don't control her feelings about what she wants. And the truth is Aunt Betty doesn't control 18 people at a dining room table. And she needs to worry about that herself. Don't even worry about her. But have the boundaries that you need and model that for your child. I love Stephen Shore. Dr. Stephen Shore, brilliant man, college professor, great career, on the autism spectrum, very outspoken advocate for those on the spectrum. And the, he's been teaching, I think he's like well over 30 years that he's been teaching and at Adelphi University. And he, so he started teaching at a time when it wasn't socially acceptable to wear a baseball hat as a professor into your classroom. But he went in to them and said, I have sensory issues and fluorescent lights from above are not great for me. Like I can see the flickering and it's very hard for me to focus. So I need 
and they were like, oh, what do we need to do? You know, do we need to rip out all of our lighting and install new lighting? And he was like, no, you just have to let me wear a baseball hat. And because he was such a good communicator and because the people at Adelphi University knew that he was brilliant and wanted him as a professor, they said yes. And, and in, in doing so made it possible for Stephen Shore to educate generations of young people um, because he was able to focus because the bill of the hat, and they didn't have to pull out any electrical equipment, right? But that's a boundary that he has. If you invite Stephen to come and speak and he's going to be on stage, um, Stephen will say to you, it's gonna, is it going to bother you? It's going to be necessary for me to wear a hat. I love this story because Stephen had the boundary. And I'm 100% sure that at some point in his life, he's come across somebody who's like, um, no, that's not going to be acceptable. I'm sorry, you're going to need to be without a baseball hat. Somebody has said that across the years. And I'm sure knowing Stephen that he probably was like, I'm sorry, you feel that way. I won't be able to do your event. He has that boundary. Now, Stephen is flexible about a million other things. A million other things. But Stephen knows himself enough to know that's going to help him to be able to focus. Uh, and so he sticks to that boundary. I'm not talking about having control boundaries. I'm talking about having personal boundaries for sensory stuff for you and for your kiddo. And everyone has sensory stuff. Every one of us has something that is not, oh, it's like, oh, I really hate that. My son hates the, the styrofoam egg carton things. Oh, I didn't know that when he was little. But now he tells me, oh, can we not get those? Can we get the paper ones instead? Yes, we, of course we can, right? Uh, I cannot stand it. If I'm trying to listen to something in front of me and if somebody is having a conversation behind me, you want to talk meltdown. I can melt down faster than any four-year-old. Uh, and I am, you know, one of those people who will turn around and give the stink eye to people and then eventually say, excuse me, I'm trying to listen. Could you please take your conversation outside? Oh, my goodness, people don't like that. <laughs> people don't like that at all. They're like, mind your own business. But if we're in a place where we're supposed to be watching the person in front of you, I'd like to be able to listen. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I have a hard time in movie theaters. Everybody just sits and chats. Uh, and I can't hear. It's not about the fact that it's rude, although it is rude. I can't hear, I can't focus, right? So I do think it's important that we know our own boundaries and that we model having boundaries so that our kids know that it's okay for them to have boundaries, that it is okay to ask for accommodations, that it's okay to say, I've had enough, I need to step outside. Early, early on on my journey, you know, you always meet other parents and you meet their kids and, and we're all different. We're all in the same committee, right? We're all in the same community, but we're all different. So I met this mom and her son was in my son's um, Fun for Four class and we ended up being friends uh, and are still friends. And um, her son has sensory issues that are much more like my sensory issues. Whereas my son has sensory issues that are much more like her sensory issues. Isn't that funny? Isn't that like slightly odd? But we went to a birthday party and it was one of those birthday parties that was in one of those ginormous gymnasiums and it had like the whole foam pit in the middle and there were mats everywhere and there was a trampoline over here, very high ceilings in like a warehouse place and they were pumping in the loud wonka, wonka, wonka music, right? Woo! Sensory-wise, it was a lot for me. It was a lot for me, and I was struggling. And I was sitting there, like they had bleachers for the parents to sit on, and I was having to do breathing exercises because if it's a, a room with a very high ceiling and there's lots of music, I don't know. It's hard for me. And eventually, she said to me, she said, I'm going to have to take my son into the the smaller room because he can't handle this many minutes of this with the high ceiling with the music. And I went, oh, I'm struggling too. And, and, she, and, and she was like, oh, see, this doesn't bother me at all. And I said, oh, this doesn't bother my son at all. So I went with her son into the quieter room where kids were just, you know, playing with like foam blocks. Uh, and, and we had a breather so that we could come back out and do the other thing. Later, 
they went into the smaller room with a lot of people in it and they were doing the birthday cake and all of the kids are in their socks, right, from having been in the gymnasium. Somebody spills Kool-Aid all over the place and now people are walking and their socks are sticking to the floor. And my son was like, he was like, I can't, I can't. I'm in this closed room and my socks are sticking to the floor and I can't. And she was like, I don't know how anybody can take this. My socks are like stuck to the floor. And, and I said, oh, you know, I'm fine. And her son was fine. But she had to take my son and they had to go out and rinse out their socks and wash their feet off and be in the, in, out in the bigger space where the noise was bouncing off and different. So the point is that, you know, we also have sensory issues. We don't have the same sensory issues as our kids, but we can model having a boundary saying, I've had enough, I need a break. So that they know, ah, that's just a thing in life. People get to the point where they've had enough and they can stop before it's too much and they can say, have a break. And they can do breathing exercises and they can do all these things. Model the behavior for your kids. Okay, Sarah has written in and said, Hi, Shannon. It was my twin boy's fourth birthday today. Happy birthday times two. It was amazing to see that they were excited. They sang the birthday song. They blew candles, open presents. Your show gives me hope and strength. Sarah, I'm so... And she says, thank you for what you do. Sarah, I am just like over the moon excited for you because I know um, for over a year you've been working yourself silly. Um, and I, these are the days, right, that we hang on to and that we celebrate. We celebrate and go woohoo because, you know, sometimes when you're climbing up the mountain and, and you're, you know, we always talk about you, you see the top of the mountain, but then you start on the mountain. You can't always see the top of the mountain. You can't really see what your progress is because you're, you're working, you're doing the thing, we're walking up the mountain, which is exactly what you got to do every day. But I love things like today where for just a second you get to see how far up the mountain you are and how, how hard you have worked and how far you have come. So amazing that they were four, that they got it, that they were excited, that they wanted to open presents. You're killing it. You're totally, totally killing it. And I celebrate you and your boys today. So mm, birthday love to everybody absolutely love that. I can't wait to see how this all unfolds for you because you're doing such a great job. Okay. Uh, we have got a few minutes here and I want to talk a little bit about what's happening this week and about what's happening this summer because we are on an abbreviated schedule this summer. And you'll see that we're doing a little bit less shows, not a lot, but a little bit less uh, shows as we go through the summer. I do want to remind you that we're doing a lot of work on the Ask Dr. Doreen website, and um, it is its own podcast now that you can download and, um, on any of the podcast platforms, but also you can subscribe to it. And I really want to encourage you to do that so that then you know whenever... Uh, she puts out a new episode, which is great. I also want to encourage you to visit AskDrDoreen.com or you can go to DoreenGrampyShay.com. I believe they're the same place. But you'll find so much information on that site um, because it's really doing a lot of work to be able to help support you, to be able to see the library of questions that she's asked in the past and be able to have better access. And you, we really want to encourage you that now if you're sending in a question for Ask Dr. Doreen, the best thing to do is to put that question in directly. There's a contact on the website. If you put in contact, there is a way for you to put in your name. And um, it, I'll tell you what's great about it is that the old way, we didn't have a way again back to you that if you sent in a question on the old chat on Autism Live, I had no way of responding back to you. I could answer your question here, but if you didn't happen to see it, it was lost in space. It was inefficient. So we really love it, especially for our opening questions. If you will put your question in for Ask Dr. Doreen on that website, on that contact form, um, we have a new person who actually takes care of your comment and makes sure that it gets answered. That's not me, because you know, uh, I have the attention span of cottage cheese. So <laughs> Oh, it's much more efficient. It's Marina will make sure that your question gets answered. She will like, you know, 
message me in the middle of the show saying you didn't a answer that person's question, please pose the question to Dr. Grand Pichet. So I hope that you will A, subscribe to her podcast and B, take advantage of that and ask questions. Again, you would go to askdrdoreen.com or you can go to DoreenGrandPichet.com and just click the contact button and there's a little form there where you put in your name and, and you don't have to put your actual name, right? We don't use names anyway, uh, at least not the whole name. We might say your first name. Um, but then you put in your comment and that gets to Dr. Grampiche and it gets to me and it gets put into the mix for our Tuesday shows. So that's super cool. Uh, also want to say that tomorrow on the show, we always have a topic that we start with and uh, this seems to be coming up a lot and so we thought it was best just to you know, get there head on. There's a fair amount of controversy about ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. And so uh, we're going to be answering questions about that, and Dr. Grampiche will talk a little bit about that, but we'll talk about other things as well. It won't be the whole, whole show. Uh, but I encourage you to be a part of that conversation. I think what's hard is that everybody has a point of view, and everybody is entitled to their point of view, but we're not all talking about the same thing. And that's what's really hard. Think about love. Think about love and how you experience love and how you feel about love. And now think about all of your friends and how they think about love and what, how they have experienced love and how they, what their outlook on love is. I mean, I could think of my five best girlfriends and I could you know, mentally go around the table and say, well, you know, I have one friend who says, you know, love stinks and that there's love is not real and that there is no such thing as love and that those of us who feel that, you know, we have love in our lives are delusional. That is her point of view. And that is her point of view because that is how she has experienced it. And I would never want to take her point of view away and go, well, that's, that's not accurate. That is her point of view. That is how she is experiencing that her point of view is valid. But I have to still say that from my point of view, I believe that love exists. I experience it on a regular basis and I am lucky enough to be married to somebody, it'll be 21 years in a few days. And, and so I know love, right? And that is the experience that I come from. And that's just talking about love. Think about everything else in the world that where people have different opinions and they're talking about the same thing but it means different things to different people. I think that, um, that, you know, that is certainly at least part of the case with ABA. But there is a lot going on in the field of ABA that needs to be discussed um, and that, that needs to be brought to light because there are some people doing some really bad ABA. And I, for one, don't want that to be the only ABA that anybody ever knows. I don't want to change the mind for the person who has experienced that ABA and say, no, you didn't experience that. No, I'm fairly certain that you did. And I'm taking your word for it that you experienced some bad ABA because I've seen it, right? But I also don't want to have it be that people who have experienced good ABA don't, aren't allowed to say that they did. And without somebody saying, no, no, you didn't. It's all bad. It's all demeaning. It's all, it's all terrible. That's my point of view on it. We'll get Dr. Grampy Shea's point of view about it. She is an expert in it. So, um, you know, I, I really love her take on all this. Um, and then uh, we've got a lot of other stuff that's happening. Over the next few days, you're going to see over the holiday weekend, you're going to see that we're going to be playing some best of back to the beginning of Autism Live. Some old shows, you're gonna see some old familiar faces, some old things um, that I think it'll be some really fun uh, shows for you guys to see. And then, um, you know, so we're gonna be going back and forth between doing some of those best of shows and doing live shows. So you wanna kinda stay tuned. If you, if you subscribe, uh, Traven puts out a thing to let you know when we're going to be live. So, you know, we love it when you guys subscribe. Um, and you can always catch us in podcasts. So, uh, in any case, 
Uh, I so enjoy being here with you guys, and I enjoy that we take a little bit, we, we always need to retool during the summer, take a little bit of a breather, catch up on things that we're behind on. We're already working on the toy guide, you guys. <laughs> it's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but we're already working on the toy guide. So we're, we're ramping up all of those things. We get a little bit of a breather in the summer um, and, so that we can hit it hard in the fall and, and be back to our regular schedule. So I appreciate you guys sticking with us and tuning in when we're live and uh, checking out some of our best of and uh, doing all of that. So I just want to thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. I will see you tomorrow live with Ask Dr. Doreen. Until then, give your kiddos a hug for me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.